For the first time in 2022, hello, Cougar football fans. Welcome back inside Studio C at the BYU Broadcasting Building in Provo, Utah, for our season debut of the Coordinator's Corner, presented by JCW's The Burger Boys. Coming up today, we'll visit with all three BYU football coordinators, special teams coordinator Ed Lamb, defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki, and offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick, as we add Aaron Roderick as we preview training camp and uh, look ahead to the season opener this Saturday at South Florida with a training camp review before the preview. We'll kick off today's show and the season of shows with BYU's special teams coordinator, safeties coach, assistant head coach, Ed Lamb. Coach Lamb, great to see you again. Thanks, Greg. Good to be here. Uh, we'll, we'll hit the first things first. Uh, the mustache is a new thing for us here on the show. A new thing, a temporary thing, as all things are. And uh, it's just what's left over from our my July vacation where I had a, a full beard. And this is, um, this is the allowable remnant of that. Very, it's, it's a positive development. Uh, and I look forward to it being with us as long as you care to keep it. All right. All right. Uh, before we uh, uh, look ahead to 2022, uh, a quick question that looks back on 2021. Uh, it was just one of, of 13 games. But, but to what extent did your last game last year, the bowl game, uh, the Independence Bowl helped to set a tone, if it did in any way, for, for 2022? Well, it certainly humbled us. I, I, um, humility is good. And I think um, our defense coming out of that game, we felt like we scored enough points on offense to win the game. And, and really the way the last drive that we were not just able to get off the field and give our offense one more opportunity and we got the ball ran on us in that situation, the four-minute drill. And so, you know, I think, uh, I think it's been good from a motivational standpoint for the players, uh, from a rethinking the way we do things as, a, as an entire staff and particularly on defense. A 10-win season is, is a good season, but did, did that element of it leave to something, uh, a little un, un, unsatisfactory finish to it maybe? Perhaps? Absolutely, yeah. 10-win yeah. ten, ten seasons for BYU are not that rare. You know, and we're here uh, the stewards of a proud program and uh, really the only – you know, the only way to elevate this program is, is consistent national relevance, and I felt like the, the last year we just fell short of that. So what elements then uh, of the 2021 season would you like to see replicated in, in 2022? Well, I think we had a very dedicated um, personnel group, our, our team. The players, they, they prepared really hard. They, um, they take it serious. They've been prepared years now in a row expecting to win. And I think from that standpoint, the program's in a really good position. We don't want to lose that. I, I'm not saying that you know, our guys are, are down um, mentally or depressed about the way that we've been playing. I, th I just think there was, there was something left on the table last year, and I think that can always be a good offseason motivator. I would think, Ed, that, that BYU would have to be one of the few schools in the FBS that returns every full-time field coach and in the same spots, the exact same spots they were in the previous season. So what's the anticipated value of that kind of continuity? Well, our players know what to expect from us. I think, um, you know, from Kalani down through the rest of the staff and, and largely because of the way that Kalani operates, our coaches feel comfortable being themselves. And we have coaches who bring a lot of passion and, and energy out, uh, out front. We have a lot of coaches that are um, you know, cerebr maybe more cerebral composed. It's important for players to know how a coach is, is going to react, how a coach is going to teach what, uh, what they can expect on a daily basis. And I think that now, um, our, our players are very much in that position, especially the veteran guys. And how about the coaches rel relative to the, to the other coaches they're working with? Is there is there value value in that? Sure. Yeah, there are roles, and uh, you know we we work hard. Kalani's worked hard to make sure that we're a, we're a, a staff that really is collaborating in in all three areas of uh, offense, defense, and special teams. And yet, the guys fall into certain roles. You know, certain guys are they, they lean towards being an engineer, and, and other guys really want to rivet in and do the work and the detail work of uh, okay great engineer we now how do we how do we actually do this and give it to the players and, and I think there's a right now there's a pretty good homeostasis right now with where our staff is at. How, how would you describe uh, Kalani's uh, leadership style having been with him as long as you have? He's a builder of others and uh, I think that's uh, that's forefront on his mind I think it's when when he goes home at night when he's away from the team I still think that that's kind of what's working in the back of his mind is is kind of the uh, you know, the, the downtrodden or underappreciated coach or player, how do we elevate that person's role? How do we bring the best out of that person? Because really that's the strength of the team is, is uh, those guys. 
Okay, let's get to the field and let's start with uh, with your position group before you expand to the special teams, um, the safeties. You found a really solid starting safety last year in Malik Moore. Uh, he answered the bell in all 13 games, and there's value in that too. The other safety spot, a bit more of a revolving door. You had four different guys start there. How would you rate the performance with one really solid guy and then one kind of shifting uh, uh, personnel group on the other side at safety last year? Yeah, I think uh, you know Malik and I have had some some real um, conversations about how to become better. He has high goals in the game and wants to be better than last year. We were able to put together some cut-ups of uh, about a 20-play cut-up of where we thought he could improve the most um, in his game, and there were some consistent themes in there. And so I think he's leading the way because he's the guy that's getting some of that attention as the returning starter and the guy that's locked in. He certainly knows that there's no such thing as a lock-in. He goes out there and competes every day, but he's uh, he's competing hard and studying hard. Ammon Hanneman has been the most consistent performer through, uh, throughout last year and in, in this fall camp and, and back to spring. So really excited what those two guys will bring. We'll play a lot of safeties. Malik's uh, INT number jumps out. He's five career interceptions, three last year. Really has some nice ball skills at his position, doesn't he? He does, yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, that's to be expected. That's what we knew we would get. He was a high school wide receiver, didn't play much defense at all. And, and uh, we knew that we were taking a developmental player. We had to teach the defensive part of the game. He's still learning it. There's still a lot of upside in him. But his ability to track a ball, bring it down, and catch it, it's definitely there. He, he can anticipate a quarterback's movement. You've already mentioned that uh, Ammon Hanneman has the inside track to work alongside Malik. Is that how you anticipate opening in South Florida with uh, with Malik and Ammon, Ammon at the two safety spots? Yes. Yeah, those guys will, those guys will take the, uh, the bulk of the reps. They'll start out the game for us. They have capable backups. We'll keep them fresh. If we don't, if we don't have a rotational plan in place uh, throughout our uh, defense, we're not going to make it in that climate in uh, Tampa. So our players know that going mm -hmm. in. They're going to protect each other. They're going to work hard for each other. We're going to make sure that we've got fresh guys on the field at all times, whatever that takes as far as the rotational system goes. So whether safety or otherwise, uh, a two deep will be implemented just for, conditionally a Saturday a in Tampa? I feel very good about our three and a, three and a half deep mm. at, uh, at the safety position, and I think uh, most other spots were two to two and a half deep on the defense. Okay, uh, so the other guys we're talking about uh, at the safety positions, um, Micah Harper would be in the mix. Hayden Livingston's already been in the mix there for you. Uh, does someone like uh, Ethan Slade or Talon Alfrey yeah. get mentioned as well? Ethan there? Slade, Talon Alfrey, Matt Criddle, those guys are all those guys are all right there. I really, really like the young guys. They, they, you know, Preston Rex has a redshirt year, but he has competed really hard and did some, did some great things throughout training camp. Carter Krupp is another one that has a redshirt year, and so it's. You know, sometimes those guys, you know, we get, we get uh, like we establish a little more patience when we're bringing them along. But really, I would feel good about any of those guys going into a game. Mm. And Preston's Isaac's brother. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, not your position, uh, but the competition at corner uh, has looked to be as good as it's been in years. And good co corners can often make good safeties look even better. How much do you like BYU's cornerback situation going into the year? Very much the same. I, you know, I feel great about the, the established guys that are there. And that, that's Caleb and, and D'Lo. Um, those guys have played the most at that particular position, but but Jacob Robinson has played as much as anybody. It's been a, a, a little bit of a hybrid position yeah. between the nickel and the corner and safety. He started some games at safety mm -hmm. last year, so um, he's another. We consider him a co-starter, and same with Gabe uh, Judy Lally. He's uh, he's uh, been an excellent addition uh, to our to our group. And then there's a bunch of young corners that we feel like at some point during this season um, mm -hmm. could or, or should play a major role. Now, Vanderbilt's a team that struggles in the SEC, but you don't become a starting corner in that league facing the talent you face week in, week out without having uh, some, so, some pretty special skills. And you bring Gabe in, Gabe Judy Lally, with that from Vandy. That's right. And he's, he's, he's mature. He understands the game. And, you know, the biggest feedback that uh, and, and probably benefit that he's given to the rest of the guys is the leadership to come in and say, like, I came here, I mean, you know, Coach Guilford reached out and established a relationship and all that, and, and recruiting is important. But in the end, these guys make decisions on, on the place, and uh, this place wins, and that's what he wanted to be a part of. So his appreciation to our players, but also his reminder of, like, this is special, this is different, we expect to win. The same, same, uh, we're getting the same type of message from Chris Brooks on a daily basis. They come here because they expect they don't have a lot of time left in their college careers, but they come here to win. They want to win, and they, they, they not just not just be on the team, stand on the sideline, but come here and 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 make a good program better. 
All right, Ed Lamb is with us. Coming up after this break, a look at uh, the BYU special teams, including Coach Lamb's special teams MVPs from camp and his early week thoughts on USF. As we head to break, we have this reminder that BYU football with Kalani Sitake returns tomorrow night, every Tuesday night, 6.30 Mountain Time on the BYU TV app. We'll have a live studio audience right here in Studio C. Hit the seat request link. You'll see it on my Twitter feed, and we'll see you here tomorrow night. This is the Coordinator's Corner. It's brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Back with more right after this. Belt high snap, punt away, blocked, and a touchdown for BYU on the punt block. That's another way to do it. Keanu Hill made the punt block, and the Cougs recover for a score. 58 to 14 with the PAT pending. All right, Coordinator's Corner continues now with BYU Special Teams Coordinator, Safeties Coach, and Assistant Head Coach Ed Lamb. We uh, took a look at Coach Lamb's safety crew in the first segment. Let's switch gears to his other area of influence, Special Teams. And, uh, Coach, let's begin uh, by maybe informing fans a bit um, how it is you divide the various Special Teams responsibilities on the staff among coaches, for example. Um, yes, so all of our coaches are, are involved in Special Teams to some degree or, the, or another. It's uh, oftentimes... It's a position within, just like on offense and defense, you'd have positions and there's position coaches that, are, that, that uh, take a coordinator's overall direction. And so we do that. You know, Kevin Kloon, for example, most of the special teams coverage positions where linebackers would play, he, he coaches that area. Most of the positions where the corners would play on coverage, um, Gennaro coaches mm -hmm. that area. So that, and that's, that's always happened. Um, the, the past several years, we, we moved away from – what we had been doing earlier in, in Kalani and I's time here where I was overseeing all the special teams and in the last several years we've had Fessy Sitake and Steve Clark have been running the punt return and kickoff return and uh, we felt like it was appropriate to go back this year where I, where I jumped uh, and got more involved in, in running all of the special teams phases. The exception to that is Daryl Funk. He, he runs the, the PAT and the field goal unit um, completely on his own and, and uh, of course with help from the rest of the staff and uh, Eliza Tuiaki does the PAT and field goal block. Okay, so that's where there's a bit of a division. Otherwise, you're taking a bit of a larger role, or resuming a larger yeah, resu role. Resuming yeah, resuming a larger role, yeah. and, and that's not uh, not because anyone's not done a, a good job. It's just we, when we shift around responsibilities on offense and defense, it's important that that takes a priority. I am the special teams coordinator of record, and I'm the one responsible for it, and in the end, I need to pick that up if somebody needs to do some more work elsewhere. Okay. Uh, what's your general philosophy on who populates special teams relative to which offensive and defensive starters, let's say, are ever off limits or that kind of thing? Yeah, nobody's off limits. It's the very best players for the position. And, um, you know, I would say the, maybe uh, the starting quarterback is, uh, is a guy that we just wouldn't look at in, in anything other than maybe a PAT or field goal holder. Other than that, uh, we have our very best players on offense and defense, our most established players. It's important for them. You know, there's a, there's a history of that. Fred Warner was a great punt coverage player for us, kickoff coverage player. There's a history of that. And, and guys that go to the NFL, like Sean Taktaki and, and uh, the, these guys. Well, Danny uh, Sorensen was a special team standout here at BYU. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And yeah. so players understand that that increases their value. I think for, for every player on the team, whether they have NFL aspirations, whether they're trying to crack the lineup or the travel squad, special teams improves their opportunities, and that's, that's the philosophy we want to continue to preach. Uh, natural focus falls on your kickers. You've got two national award nominees in place kicker Jake Oldroyd and punter Ryan Rico. Both guys pacing among to be really among the best ever at BYU at their respective positions. What a great position to be in. They are, and it's going to be a real battle this first game. Uh, South Florida is very similar. They've got all of their key specialists returning, punter, kicker, punt returner, kickoff returner, snappers, and, and uh, so it's going to be two very experienced uh, units going at it on the field, and, and we really like our guys, what they bring. Jake Oldroyd has battled the back issues throughout his career. Uh, has the situation stabilized, improved, or still kind of uh, wait and see week to week with Jake? Yeah, we really expect him to play in every single game. So from that standpoint, I believe it's stabilized. I think we've, we're getting smarter on, on what type of practice and preparation is best for him, the type of volume and intensity. And I think he's, as we've grown and seen, as we've grown in our trust of him, he's been able to take uh, some leadership in that role, deciding how much and how often to kick. So this is your seventh season on the staff, meaning seventh season for Kalani. It's still remarkable to think about Jake being the guy that uh, kicked the winning field goal in Kalani's first game at BYU. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, that was an amazing moment. Ryan Rico would perhaps be better known if he punted more, uh, but I know that you and he are happy to sacrifice some notoriety for offensive productivity when you need him. He's been awesome. 
That's right. Yeah, and 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 you know, similar to the situation we described with Malik, he's not, he's certainly not resting on his laurels. He he knows areas that he can get better and and improve the punt team around him, and so he's worked really hard at that this off season. I can't. I can't explain exactly what we're going to do different. It'll be pretty obvious if you study that part of the game in game one, but I'm really excited to see what he brings this year. Might he change his, uh, are we talking about changing? A, are we, <laughs> we're not are we, talking about anything <laughs> until next week. <laughs> well, great. Yeah. At, at least I, I know to be a little more attentive now on, on game day. It's exciting. Um, how about the uh, the holder long snapper uh, situation? Uh, is, is it uh, as, as it's been to this point? Does Ryan hold for you still on PATs and field goals and uh, uh, Britt and, and Riggs will be your guys there? Or? Um, yeah, Austin Riggs um, uh, took the job last year and, and was just, uh, just slightly more consistent. It was such a close battle. Britt Hogan is a fantastic snapper as well. They've both got even better in this offseason, so feel really good about where, at, where we're at with the long snapper. And Ryan Rico has been our full-time holder, and he continues to be that. Okay, who's your backup holder if you had to go with one right now? Uh, Hayden Livingston, Talmadge Gunther. We, we like uh, both of those guys. They both work at it, and because they both play other positions, we feel like you know, we can't rely on one or the other right now. We need them both to be ready. Okay, let's go to your camp MVPs on special teams. Who did you like uh, over the last few weeks? You know, it, it really the, the new one, uh, Chika Ebunoha, he did a wonderful job of just coming in and just he plays full speed all the time. He's a, he's one of the young corners that we're so excited about, and a lot of those corners are you know they're they're, they're fighting in the in the defensive part of the game and trying to learn the system. Uh, Chica just goes out and treats special teams like that's his playground, and it's been obvious to the whole team. This is not me picking him out of uh, you know some corner and and uh, highlighting him. It's really obvious how much he enjoys it, how good he is at it. And so we're going to see him in that phase. Where do we see him on special teams? You know, he'd be a guy, you know, we have, I think everybody understands there are our, our punt gunners, mm -hmm. uh, but we also have gunners on kickoff, and I think he fits in both of those spots. Fantastic. Let's get to the uh, season opener here on Saturday. It's USF, a team that BYU beat 35-27 uh, here in Provo last season, a team, though, that beat BYU back in Tampa in 2019. Their new starting quarterback is a guy that has a win over BYU while playing for Baylor just last year down in Waco. Uh, what do you expect to get from USF on Saturday? Well, we know how good uh, Gary Bohannon is, the transfer from Baylor. And, and we, quite uh, frankly, we had a lot of uh, problems with the quarterback uh, last year that was here, Timmy McLean. McLean yeah. And he's ended up transferring. So He went to UCF. He went to UCF. Yeah. So, so they've got a tremendous, uh, yeah, we may see him at some point in the future. They've yeah. got... They had two uh, tremendous options, in our opinion, and so and, and we have already have a lot of respect for Gary and the way he does things. So we're expecting to have our hands full. Their head coach has already talked about uh, the challenges really facing both teams, not just BYU, the visitor, but uh, a four o'clock afternoon start in the humidity of South Florida. That's a challenge. Absolutely, yeah. We just you know we kind of want to. We're of the philosophy: you simply state those things. Uh, you talk about the strategies that we're going to use, and then you move on, and you practice like it's any other week, and that's that's what we've done, and our, our players are going to be ready for it and mentally prepared. All right, it is here. Uh, great to uh, be with you again, Coach Lamb, to start the season off, and we will see you again soon back in Studio C. Thank you. Likewise, thank All you. All right, that is Coach Ed Lamb. As we go to break, a reminder that uh, dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, now in Harriman. This weekend, BYU plays at South Florida. Tune in to Cougar Pregame Live on BYU Radio beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern, noon Mountain Time. Coming up next, defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki joining me in Studio C. You're in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's. The Burger Boys, back after this. You're in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys, as our training camp review and season opening preview continues. All three BYU football coordinators with us on our season premiere. We heard from special teams coordinator Ed Lamb in the first two segments. Now it's offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick still to come. But right now we bring in defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki. He's also BYU's defensive tackles coach. Coach E, good to see you again. It's great to be back. All right, here we go. And we are back. Uh, before we talk about camp and look ahead to the opener Saturday, uh, let, let's kind of wrap up your thoughts on the BYU defense of 2021 because it plays into this year. Uh, that means talking about kind of like various versions of the defense last year because the group you started with wasn't really the one you finished with at the end of the year. Kind of a brutal year for defensive injuries in 2021. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, when, when luck's on your side and you're playing deep into the year, into the season, and you're, you're still healthy, I mean, that's just kind of the way things go. But it's a violent sport. 
Um, sometimes it's just, you know, uh, having the ball bounce the right way, but also having the right guys healthy. And last year wasn't the case for us. And so really just as the year went on, trying to find different ways to, to uh, stay in games and win the game. And I thought the offense did a really good job just floating us by as we were trying to, t to hang on on defense. And we saw and here, you know, a highlight of just a few of the names of guys who missed games. And, and uh, you know, certainly Keenan Peely, as early in the season as you lost him, really kind of uh, changed your course a little bit, didn't it, defensively? It did. It did. It, uh, you know, he was the anchor of the defense. And, and uh, you know, just so much was, re was revolving around him. But then so much was put on Peyton after that, as well as Chaz and, and Ben. And um, it, it just changed a lot of different uh, you know, philosophies that we had as far as just the way we needed to do things and change things. If there was one, uh, what was the silver lining on last season's dark injury cloud? There, there was a silver lining. I thought, as we talked about it, was um, getting so many young guys uh, get reps, you know, play games. And so um, we came back after the 2020 year of losing all those guys and, and uh, you know, weren't expected to be, you know, as good and, and thought that we battled through and especially early in the year. But then we, we had just tons of kids, freshmen that were getting snaps, that were playing, that were getting uh, live reps that uh, now we go in, when we get those healthy guys back, we've got a lot of game experience going in this year. So the, the result is this year's defense returns more than 200 collective starts and more than 90% of your defensive stats from last season. Then when you bring back top line players who were hurt like Keenan, uh, you have to be expecting an uptick in your defensive numbers, I would think. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I, at least in this fall camp, you know, just kind of gauging how we were playing our own offense, which our offense is really, really uh, dynamic and special. And, and uh, you know, for us to be competing with them, to be battling and, and uh, you know, to see just different things from different people, this fall camp was huge for us. Did you, I mean, if there was a dip last year in defensive performance, do you think you see the reason for it? And, and was it almost purely injury related, do you think? Do you think you were, I mean, if you stayed healthy, yeah. would you have just simply been a better defense? Oh, well, for sure. I mean, the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, some of it is just uh, when, you're, when you're trying to scheme, when you're kind of uh, sitting there as coaches, philosophizing, just trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's the best way to go about it? Um, I mean, you know, it really just go, comes back on, on myself as a coordinator, as a coach, is just, um, you know, we're trying to put guys in the best situ you know, situation and scenario to win games. Uh, may or may not have been the, been the best thing. As we look back on it, like it's always, uh, you know, hindsight's always 2020. You, you look at it and you're like, okay, we, um, after this game, uh, thought that this would happen. We're going back now, now that what we, we, we know what we know, probably would have done this a little bit differently and maybe gone this direction with the scheme. So there's so many different things. And, um, you know, the, the silver lining to that as a defensive staff is we've got so many different schemes in our mind now and just uh, ways to draw back on our experience of just saying, hey, we, we thought this, did this, worked, didn't work. Now we can come back and feel, feel better about uh, if we go down that same path of losing a lot of, a lot of guys. Okay, let's, let, let's look positionally a little bit. Uh, defensive line, as deep as any position on your team, uh, your depth chart gets into the double digits with guys who can play. Um, who are you counting on, though, to lead the way uh, up front this year? Uh, we, we, we ended uh, fall camp going into the prep with, uh, with Batty and uh, Fisher as our OEs and, and uh, those guys really playing. But Logan Luthuli is, is a guy that transferred to us. Um, and Jack DeMooney's son-in-law, <laughs> he's, uh, he's made a really, really, uh, I mean, he's, he's, just, he's been impressive in the snaps that he's played. And so we think that he's going to be a guy that pushes and helps us out there at the open end spot. And, but, you know, the, all, all those tackles, I mean, you've got Caden Hawes, uh, Gabe Summers, Lorenzo Falatea, uh, Earl Mariner that we've kind of solidified as probably the four that are going to end up playing the most most snaps there and then um, Blake Mangelson and John John Nelson have been just really really good this fall camp uh, playing the strong end. You told The Athletic uh, that Tyler Batty could be a guy who racks up double digit sacks this season. Uh, he burst onto the scene as a freshman and is still relatively young in his playing career. Uh, you you clearly expect big things from from ninety two. Yeah, did I say that to the athletic? It sounds like you did. At least they <laughs> quoted you as, as as saying he could. Like they brought up, I think they brought up Corbin Kafusi, who was like the last guy to have double digits at sacks. Oh, one of the Kafusis, and he said okay. Tyler could be a guy like that that, that gets okay, up there. Okay, now, <clears throat> yes, in answer yeah. to your question, I mean he has the capability uh, to do those things. But you know, a lot of times the the guy that gets all those all the, all the credit and all the sacks, which Batty could be, very well be that guy. There's a lot, there's a lot uh, more that comes because the guy on the other side or the two interior guys are pushing them. And so I, I feel like we've got a good front uh, right now and we've, 
uh, you know, obviously we're, we're looking for sacks at the right time. Uh, this this game, you know, may or not may or may not be that game just because these is a run RPO team. But we're definitely looking for those opportunities to to get takeaways and, and get sacks when we can. Let's see if the athletic got this one right. You were also quoted as saying that that the way you're going to be ready for the 2022 schedule is up front on the D line. Oh man, I can't even remember this interview, but uh, I do feel comfortable about the about the the front. Do feel like. The young guys that played last year, I mean, they're going to give us some quality snaps this year. Uh, I feel like with the backers that have come back, I, I feel really good about the about the box. I feel like we've got a good front seven, um, and you know, obviously with the depth that we've added with some of the corners and safeties coming back, I feel feel pretty good. And you already you've already established that you that you're quite comfortable with a pretty liberal ro rotation on the D line. Like a lot of guys, a lot of guys get snaps. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's we look back at last year and just you know the guys that got dinged up, the guys that were missing. Um, similar schedule. We've got 10 games straight, and we're not, you know, we're not. It's not like we're just, uh, you know, beating up on the sisters of the poor. It's, it's we're playing just teams that are going to be physical, teams that are going to challenge us, and we've got to have, uh, we've got to have enough girth and just meat up front in order to play these teams. All right, let's take a break, and as we do, we'll tell you that uh, pregame coverage of BYU's Saturday season opener at South Florida begins with expanded game day coverage on BYU TV starting two hours prior to kickoff at noon. Mountain Time, 2 o'clock Eastern. Coming up next, we'll continue our conversation with BYU defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki. Get his defensive MVPs from training camp as well. This is the Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Down again, he threw it while he was going down. Here in the Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. BYU coming off a 10-3 season, prepping to open his 2022 campaign with a number 25 AP ranking, kicking things off at Raymond James Stadium this Saturday versus South Florida in Tampa. We're visiting with BYU defensive coordinator and D-tackles coach Eli Satuiaki. In the last segment, we talked personnel on the defensive line. Let's look at the guys playing behind the front four. E, uh, linebackers hit hard with the injuries last season, <coughs> talked about that. Loss of Keenan Peely, really painful. Um, can the occupier step back into the same role you were going to have him in last year? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, I mean, just again, uh, part of that silver lining is just getting all those guys back and just got all those guys uh, with so much game experience and um, so many of those guys that are playing backup roles now um, started for us. And so it's going to be going to be a good thing to have all that experience back. You lost Peyton Wilgar for some of last season. He's back. Uh, Max Tooley returns. Ben Bywater got a lot of reps last back. He, uh, last year he's back. Jack, Jackson Kafusi also there. Pepe Tanovasa too. Uh, Fisher Jackson, you brought him up. Uh, more of a hybrid guy between D-line and linebacker with Fisher right now? Yeah, it depends on the package, but, I mean, those guys are defensive ends, um, you know, and, and some ends, and some, some schemes you drop. And so, Batty's playing that, uh, Fisher's playing it, as well as uh, Logan Lutui, um has stepped up to play that. And, and you know, Alema Pilimai is another name that's just uh, competing at that spot to contribute. Is Pepe more a linebacker now? Pepe's, Pepe's uh, yeah. Okay. He's, he's a backer, middle backer. Okay. Uh, BYU secondary also returns a lot of starting reps from last season. And then you add an SEC starter and Gabe Judy Lally to the competition in the offseason as well. Pretty deep group back there. Yeah, yeah. We feel feel really good about having the corners that can, um, you know, give us some snaps where we, we don't have to really uh, cater the coverage uh, to uh, certain situations, certain people. We just play ball and try to play the, the scheme and coverage that we think is going to be best in the moment. Jacob Robinson uh, was an impact player as a newcomer at safety last year, and he's uh, he's a safety, he's a corner, he's a nickel, he's really versatile, isn't he for you, uh, Jacob? Yeah, yeah, he's he's been a uh, he's been a, a bright spot for us at the corner spot. Just being able to move him around, play him in different packages, play him in different spots has been really good. And um, you know, anytime any player can can uh, be multiple like that, it adds a lot of value. Where's George Udo in your defensive mix right now? He's playing safety primarily, but he's he's playing nickel as well. So he and um, he, uh, Jacob Boren and uh, Jacob Robinson are the ones that will play nickel for us. Okay, this is your seventh season. Uh, it's just tough to do this because each team has its own, you know, personality and set of circumstances. But relative to defensive depth, seven seasons in, is this as, would you say, just going into a year, that you feel as good as you've felt about uh, a two and three deep. It part. is, it is. It's uh, it's the deepest that I've felt um, and, and also just come back with so much experience, right? So the 2020 year felt like it was a lot of experience that came back, uh, probably not as deep uh, as, as we are this year. We've got a lot of uh, young, young players that are, that are uh, you know, knocking on the door to, to, to play, play some games for us as well as just travel. And um, we're, we're getting to the point right now in defense, it's just, you know, we're, 
it's a it's a good difficult dis, uh, decision that we're having to make. Where you're, you're you have good players that may or may not to travel, make the travel squad for that week, and just finding different roles for guys. Okay, you've been into USF prep for a bit, but when camp wrapped up and you look back at your defense. Who did you think about as standouts, or do you take a broader look at how this defense performed during camp? Yeah, you know, obviously you've got the the, the backers, the and the, the three big backers for us, with Keenan, Peyton, and, and Ben, uh, Max too. Really, I didn't mention him, but those guys have just done a phenomenal job. But there, there's just been, I mean, we look at it and we were actually kind of laughing about it as coaches, kind of just like. There are a lot of guys who are just a bunch of no-name dudes that may, you know, people don't know about that are quietly going about just playing like a starter. And so, um, you know, we've, we've uh, given the name to just a bunch of no-name defensive guys and, and uh, feel that way right now. I mean, obviously, as they, they continue to play and, and shine, uh, people will know who they are and learn who they are, but there are some, there are some uh, just average names in there that people don't really recognize that are, that are going to make a difference for us in, in this year's defense. So a nice mix of the big names and the no names, yep. I guess, right now. That's right. All right. Um, season opens Saturday at South Florida. Uh, they have a new offensive coordinator uh, calling his first plays for USF. That's Travis Trick at the OC. He does have a lot of uh, coordinator experience in the past, including in the SEC at Mississippi State. Uh, he's known as a coach who favors a fast-paced offense, and he, he's a quarterback you've seen already in Gary Bohannon. Good receivers and backs that you saw last year. They scored 27 at your place last year. And I know that Kalani didn't like the way maybe BYU finished out against USF right. last year. Uh, give us some thoughts maybe early week on, on the Bulls. Uh, you know, they're, they're the, uh, the second uh, leading uh, return team as far as just uh, getting experience back, right? Mm -hmm. and, so and you're right up there with them. We're, we're, I, I think we're number one. Yeah, they're, they're number, number two. two. And yeah. so, um, I mean, with the, they, it's about this year, get year three for an offense that's coming in that starts to click and you get guys that are coming back. And obviously the, the quarterback has experience, but they've got – uh, they've got the players to score points. They've got the scheme to score points. And so um, it'll definitely be a challenge for us. And, you know, we're at their home. And last time we went there, it wasn't so good for us. And so this will be a tiebreaker between the, the game there, here, uh, for us. And we've got we've to show up. We've got to be ready to play some physical defense as well as just be, be up to par with their speed. So, so what's going to matter most, do you think? Uh, the personnel that they bring back offensively that you kind of already know or a new coordinator uh, calling his first place for that team. What what has more of an impact, do you think, and how what you expect from them? You know, the the, the players players are what what make you good, right? And and so I think um, you know, obviously the head coach being an offensive guy and new coordinator, they'll you know they'll they'll scheme and they'll do things or maybe a, a couple of tweaks here and there. But I think that the philosophically they come from really a lot of the same background and what they do. Um, and so it's it's difficult to say what they're going to be doing. We have to see in the first couple of series just how they're trying to attack us. But I uh, feel like they're, they're players. Uh, they're, they have good players, and they're going to come back. They have a lot of speed, and they have a lot of experience, and just running that offense and uh, the offensive style is going to be difficult for us to stop. Well, it's great to be with you again. Uh, Coach Lamb brought, uh, brought the mustache look for the first time, I think, on Coordinator's Corner or earlier before you. You're also sporting the mustache. Is this a thing, or is it going to be a come-and-go kind of thing? This, this is the first time uh, of me sporting a mustache in my life, and so I don't know if it's here to stay or what, but we were in a team meeting in, uh, early in camp, and Kalani took a shot at me and made fun of me, said I look like Nacho Libre or something like that. And the team <laughs> erupted in laughter, and so now I can't be the guy that shaves it off. i got to leave it on. Like, okay, you can't poke fun at me, and then I'm going to change. I've got I've to leave it on at least for a couple of games. That's all I can think about now. Uh, and uh, well, A-Rod's going to make it a hat trick, right? Is he still sporting the mustache over he, there? He was. I mean, they were. He was the trend. They've been doing it. They've been doing it. That's, that's nothing new for them. It's the defensive guys that are just kind of coming up out of nowhere trying to follow them. All right. Mustache hat trick coming up with, uh, with A-Rod. E, great to have you with us. We'll do it again soon. Appreciate it. All right. Tomorrow at uh, 7 Eastern time on the BYU TV app, catch after further review as a Dave McCann, Blaine Fowler, and David Nixon break down the game like never before. Time for our break. When we come back, we'll bring in offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick. As the coordinator's corner continues, we're brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Back with more right after this. Coordinator's Corner on BYU TV is brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Built Bar. Fuel the journey. And by... Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. 
back on the coordinator's corner in our 2022 season premiere number 25 BYU opening its season Saturday at South Florida and as we do to kick off every season of shows here on the coordinator's corner all three coordinating coaches with us we've covered special teams and the defense now to the offensive side of the ball with OC and QB coach Aaron Roderick a hey, Rod great to see you again good to be here all right uh, before we get into camp and the season opener at Tampa uh, last year's offense was outstanding uh, here's some numbers. Top 30 in scoring, top 25 in completion percentage, yards per completion, points per play, yards per rush, and red zone scoring. Top 20 total offense, top 15 third downs, yards per pass attempt and pass efficiency, top 10 yards per play, TD to INT ratio and turnover margin, and top 5 in red zone TD percentage. Those are all excellent. What did you like most? <laughs> wow. You made us sound good. <laughs> um, <coughs> Well, I think just the way we took care of the ball last year was something we did, you know, that I'm, I'm particularly proud of. Um, but then there was also the great lesson that uh, the two, two of the games where we didn't take good enough care of it cost us the game. And so that's probably the one that stands out to me the most because that's the lesson we're just always trying to teach the players, you know, that, that the ball matters so much and you can't give it away. Okay, uh, 10 and 3 was the ultimate record last year. And um, again, 10 wins is pretty good. Uh, but Ed Lamb also said 10 wins isn't so rare at BYU. You, you know, 10 wins is good, but yeah. I know that that 11th, you felt like the 11th was in you and not getting it in, in Shreveport uh, kind of stung at the end, didn't it? Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's a, good, it's a good thing when, you know, 10 wins doesn't feel like you won the national championship. You know, I mean, it's, it's a. It's a sign that the program's in a good place where 10 wins, you can recognize it was a good season, but you can also, you know, feel, feel some disappointment that, hey, we were really close to doing something even better. Uh, you entered last season with one of the lowest percentages in returning offensive production. Yeah. You start this season at number one by most measures. You've got to put it together on the field still, but you, ha you can hope to hit the ground running in a lot of ways uh, with as many guys as you have back, right? Yeah, we hope to, but you know, it's a new season and that's the, the one thing I've really been trying to uh, hit on in camp is that we have to keep our edge. You know, a year ago we, we, um, we had a lot to prove with all those new guys and um, sort of low expectations, I think, with how, many, how much turnover we had. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to keep our edge and, and learn to play consistently at the same level. Last August, uh, your training camp featured a competition at quarterback. Uh, this time around, it's Jaron Hall's job from the get-go. He was so good last season. Uh, um, among the elites when it came to all-around efficiency through the air and on the ground. So what is on your and his to-do list in 2022 at quarterback? You know, just to get a little bit better at, at everything. You know, it wasn't – he doesn't have any glaring deficiencies in his game. Um, there wasn't any – major area where we had to have massive improvement it was just hey if we can just you know keep improving in every area just a little bit you know just find another completion or two here or there uh, one one or two more good decisions per game and I think that's going to show and I think his experience is really going to show this year now that we can look back on it how tough was Jaron just to get in as many games as he did considering he got banged up pretty early in the season and kept you know, trying to answer the bell. Yeah, Jaron's a tough kid, um, and he actually could have played probably. And he missed three games. Two of the two of the games he missed, he probably could have played. We just we had so much confidence in Baylor uh, that we had the luxury of of, of uh, playing him and knowing we could win with him. Um, but I, you know, the goal this year is keep him healthy. You know, and that's that's what we're going to try our best to do. Okay, how much of schematics can help with that? A lot. I mean, yeah, we want to we want to protect him. I thought we did a good job of that last year. We were, I don't know if that was one of the stats you rattled off, but you know, our quarterback didn't get sacked very much last year, and um, that's we're always going to strive to protect him as much as we can. And then he's a very good runner, but we will try to be as smart as we can with when we choose to run him. Okay, uh, you mentioned Baylor. He's gone. Jacob Conover is now your solid number two. How do you assess the state of the QB room, uh, Jacob, and beyond? Uh, it's good. We just we got to keep improving for sure. But there's there's uh, some good players in that room. A lot of athletic ability. Um, one thing I do like about the group is they're all very similar in skill set, size, and so we don't have to you know change our offense much depending on who's in there. Okay. Uh, besides the play of Jaron Hall, much of the positivity around the offense centers on the offensive line. What did training camp reveal about that group? Mostly just what we already knew. There's, there's a lot of veteran experience there. I think we have 
Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's eight guys that have started games against Power 5 opponents. Um, and then we added Kingsley in there as well. So there's a lot of good, a lot of good players there. Now, you're, you were quoted as saying Kingsley Suamataya is the best athlete you've ever seen on the offensive line. You've coordinated with some great offensive linemen uh, in your time as a college coach. So what makes him special already? Just sheer athletic ability. He, the guy, fact that a guy that big can move his feet and run like that is, is uh, you don't see that that often. And we have some good athletes on the line. I mean, those guys are all athletic. Most of them were two sport, three sport guys. Several of them played tight end or or other you know other positions in high school. Blake was a quarterback, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Joe Joe was a tight end. You know. Um, Connor Pay is a really good baseball player. Um, Clark Barrington's a multi-sport guy. I mean, those guys are athletes. And uh, but Kingsley, he's he's something else. Uh, any offense that loses a record-setting running back to the NFL has some shoes to fill. Chris Brooks joins the running back room featuring Katoa, Davis, McChesney, Ropati, and others. Uh, could you ask Chris to take on an Algier-like uh, workhorse workload? Or is that in the plan? Yeah, that's what we're asking, and uh, I think he's I think he's I expect him to be ready for it. We have some other good running backs that we trust a lot, but um, Chris has been all business since he got here, and I expect him to carry the load. How fortunate did you feel to end up with a talent like Chris? Very fortunate. I, I've, I felt like Chris is the best player at Cal the last three years. I mean, I've, I've followed that program. I knew who Chris was in high school. Um, we were recruiting him when I coached at Utah, and I, so I've known a lot about him, and I feel like he's, he's sort of been underrated on a team that maybe didn't get a lot of attention for what they were doing on offense, but he was, he's been very productive, very durable, and um, we're excited to see what he can do for us. So you clearly believe that putting that piece with the pieces you've already got, blocking for him and around him on the edges, you've got something special, you hope? Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to compare anyone to Tyler, but I, I think that Chris is ready to be an every down back. And then, of course, you know, Peeney's better than he's ever been. Uh, Jackson McChesney has always stepped up and played well every time he's gotten an opportunity. So we're really excited about where he's at. And he's healthy, healthier than he's ever been. That's been the only thing that's held him back. And, uh, and then I expect, you know, Miles Davis to have a role this year. And we'll, we'll, it's a good, good group. It is. Time again for a break. When we come back, a look at the BYU receivers and a preview of BYU and USF with Coach Aaron Roderick. But as we step away, we remind you that for your daily Cougar sports play-by-play, -play, tune in weekdays to BYU Sports Nation at noon Eastern time on BYU TV and BYU Radio. You're in the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's. The Burger Boys, back with more from A-Rod right after this. The pull away and the takeoff by Jaron Hall, and he is gone. The 40, the 30, the 20, he will score. Touchdown, Jaron Hall on fourth and one. Takes it all the way to the house, and the Cougars are back in the game. Here in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. We're with BYU offensive coordinator and QB coach Aaron Roderick right now. Cougs traveling to Tampa Thursday to take on the Bulls of USF Saturday. Third meeting in a series tied at one. BYU beat the Bulls 35-27 last year in Provo. We talked QB, O-line, run game in our last segment. Let's hit the pass catchers now. The talent is there at tight end and wide receiver. Certainly just about getting guys healthy, keeping guys healthy and available. How would you say camp went on that front at tight end and wide out? Good. Yeah, we have we have a good group at both of those positions. Um, super excited about Isaac Rex. You know, we're we're not trying to keep it a secret. He's going to play in the first game, which was a real uh, pleasant surprise to me. You know, I, I was hoping to get him back this season, but thought it might be a month into the year, maybe even halfway through the year, due to how serious that injury was. And uh, he looks great, and he's going he's going to play in the first game. And um, I'm super proud of him and excited to have him back. Rex and Holker could be a dynamic duo for you there. Mason Wake is in the mix, and yeah. he and Houston Haymuli are, are some big bodies you can use uh, and move them around a bit. Yeah, those first three guys you mentioned are all going to, you know, big factor in our offense again, as they have been in the past, and all three of them are better than they've ever been. Um, so looking, really looking forward to watching those guys play. They're a fun group. They're a fun group of guys, and, and uh, they love the game. How about Houston's role? Uh, Houston is... He'll be on the travel squad, and he's, he's coming along um, just a little bit behind those other guys, um, but he's, he's with us. Okay. Uh, wide receiver's kind of loaded when you've got a full room. 
uh, too deep at your top three spots, Nakua, Romney, Epps, Roberts, uh, Cosper, uh, Hill. Um, and, man, Chase Roberts, uh, I like the way he's looked. He's, he's been a year, it's been a long time since he played high school ball, but it looks like he's ready to really shine for you. Yeah, Chase has had a really good offseason. He got, you know, he, he was on the team last year, but his – he was just one of those guys I would say his mission was hard on him. You know, I mean, some guys come home in better shape than others. And he uh, it took him a year to get his legs back. Um, but he is a really athletic guy who is looking really good. And I'm excited to see him playing a game. A 6'4 wide receiver, yeah. good route runner. Yeah, he can run. And, um, you know, he was a highly recruited guy for a reason. Yeah. There was a lot of teams that wanted him, and we were fortunate enough to get him. And... Um, now he's, he's really in good shape and knows our offense. He's doing a good job. Again, the common thing is to say we're as, you know, this is as deep as they've been at this position or that. But in terms yeah. of wideouts, when they're all together and, and healthy, that's a, that's a pretty solid group, right? Yeah, I'm always hesitant to say, yeah. you know, compare anything to anything in the past uh, until we go prove it. But I like the guys we have to work with, and I'm looking forward to. You know, we already know what we're going to get from, from a couple of those guys like Puka and Gunner and uh, Keanu showed up last year. And I'm excited to see now. You know, Braden Cosper's healthy now, and Cody Epps is healthy again, and, and uh, of course, Ch we mentioned Chase, and it's just going to be fun to see some of those, those guys that we haven't seen a lot of, see how they react when the, when the lights are on. Okay, you're already into USF prep, as we talked about with Coach E, but uh, camp uh, took up most of the month of August. Uh, who'd you like as someone that really stood out and maybe identified himself as an MVP for you on that side of the ball? Clark Barrington would be a guy that stands out every day. Just his consistency, his toughness, his leadership. Um, he's going to play in the NFL. My, uh, you know, barring some, some, you know, I don't know. I, I just see him being a, a veteran. He reminds me of Brady Christensen. You know, mm. some of those guys that just great leader, and just shows up every day. Fantastic. Camp MVP on offense, Clark Barrington. Uh, Brother Campbell is also going to see some time this year, right? Yeah, Campbell's in the mix, and you'll see him play. Um, he'll, he'll, he'll get in the first game. He'll play. Okay, Saturday at South Florida, you get a Bulls team with a, a defensive coordinator in his first season. Uh, last year's USFD really struggled. Uh, but with a new coach in charge, Bob Shoup, uh, he's promising a full-court press for 60 minutes, whatever that means. Uh, how much does last season's video of that defense help with this year's assignment with the new D.C.? We don't know. That's the problem is, um, you know, Coach Shoup, he's an excellent coach. Uh, anyone in this profession knows he's got a great reputation. He had best defense in the nation a few years ago at Mississippi State. He's had consistently had high-ranked defenses at Penn State and, and you know, I mean, he's in, in other places he's been. Um, so we know they're going to be squared away. They play really hard. And they've got a bunch of transfers in addition to the bunch of returning guys last year who I'm sure have all improved. Um, so... We know we've got our hands full. No looking past this opener. People look at it. Wow. And they, they, they've won, you know, two, three games over the last three years. It's not. It... Hey, this game will humble you fast if you look past anyone. And we know that. Um, we've learned that. Shoot, we learned that in the bowl game last year. Um, we have absolute total respect for this team. And, uh, you know, I, I just know they know a lot more about us than we know about them. So that's, that's another challenge to this game is, is just – they could come out and do something totally different, and we wouldn't have any way to prepare for it. We just got to be ready to go play. All right. You know, be ready. Coach, we'll see you on the weekend. Thanks for being here today. We'll do it again soon. That's Coach Roderick for Coach Tuiaki and Coach Lyle. I'm Greg Grubel. It's been the Coordinator's Corner. Have a great week. Go Cougs.